Alhamdulillahi wahdahu wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabi ba'dahu Nabiyuna Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Wa anna ma'ahum ila yawmiddin Ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika lah Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh wa ba'd We start by praising and glorifying Allah, God Almighty We ask for His guidance We ask Him to bless this gathering with the truth, to let nothing but the truth remain in our hearts and to make us such people that we are pleasing to him. I'm going to briefly uh, introduce uh, uh, Mr. Bruce Kent. I think um, most of us are aware of him through his activities in relation to the CND, which obviously sprung up in relation to the nuclear disarmament program and the concerns. Um, he has traveled all the way from London today, very kindly on very short notice, so we are grateful to him for his presence, for coming and helping us to enrich this session with his input. He is the Vice President of the Movement for the Abol Abolition of War, and he was, the, uh, is he still, the Vice President of Pax Christi. Um, he had been an active uh, priest, Catholic priest, for 30 years, and I have been requested by him not to prolong the introduction too much, so I'm going to cut it there and uh, hand you over to Abu Alia. And Abu Alia you already know because you've had uh, several inputs from him and the platform will be shared by both of them I'm chairing but I'll just stay quietly in the corner um, Abu Ali is uh, speaking after Mr. Bruce Kent so Mr. Bruce Kent speaks first for about 15-20 minutes and then uh, Sidi Abu Ali speaks for 15-20 minutes and then any remaining time we take up by answering trying to answer any questions you may have uh, the only thing is we have to finish uh, pretty much on time because his taxi Mr. Bruce Kent's taxi is coming at quarter past seven, so he must leave quite promptly. So without further ado, Jazakumullah uh, Khairan, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well friends, I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I am quite amazed that you have 2,500 or something people gathered here. I had no idea that you had an organization with such a, a base support. I wish we had the same. So I really congratulate you and I'm very glad to be here on this subject. When I was in the army, which was a long time ago, 1947 to 1949, I was a wireless instructor, uh, changing valves and all that. And I remember the instructor told me, if you're ever giving a public talk, first of all, tell them what you're going to say, then say it, and then remind them what you did say. And that, that way you have some hope that someone's going to actually listen to what you're talking about. Well, my, my simple message today is that I believe that war is not only against God's will, which I believe it certainly is. It is also destructive, immoral, illegal, counterproductive, and actually avoidable. It is not something that we're doomed for, for all of history. And I believe that is the message that we have to work on to see how we can actually do something about changing the culture which makes war such an appropriate solution, apparently, to so many problems, though it usually ends up as a complete disaster. My own experience of war, the Second World War, I was still, I was too young for the army, but I remember bombs and all that, but my real ex experience of war was the Nigerian Civil War of 1966 to 1970. I spent some time in Nigeria at that time, and I saw who are the victims of war, and the victims of war are the innocent non-competents, women, children, old people, and I saw one of the most horrendous sorts of wars because it was the war of starvation blockade. And in that war, about a million and a half people uh, died. And again, it was in a sense a superpower war from outside as well. So that's the beginning of my experience of actual warfare. My commitment uh, to, the, uh, to the abolition of war is both, I think, realistic and optimistic. Incidentally, I'm looking at the clock. This is a wonderful hall because every speaker has a clock to look at and so he knows perfectly well when he's gone more than the 15 or 20 minutes promised. So my own, my own uh, approach to all this is that uh, we, nobody wants war. I do not believe, unless you are pathologically insane, that people want to fight wars. People get into wars for all sorts of reasons who know very little about it. Now, warfare today has changed in all kinds of ways. As we speak tonight, there are probably about 20 wars that I would classify as wars going on. 
but most of them are not actually wars any longer between states. They're within states by groups that don't accept the particular political or social structure uh, or the racial harmony or whatever it may be of that particular area or community. It's changed in a way in that way, though we've always had non-state wars. It's also changed in the sense that it is, and I love this title, Ravaging the Earth. War is capable now of ravaging the earth in a way that was previously unthinkable. Uh, the consequences of war today affect everybody. It affects the climate, it affects the oceans, it affects the hills, the, le the land. I believe in Vietnam something like 80% of the foliage in Vietnam was destroyed by the dropping of Agent Orange, a defoliant uh, in Vietnam. There are today, I'm leaving these, someone might want to photocopy a few afterwards. It's something we did in the movement for the abolition of war, the consequences of war and the results. At least 50 nuclear warheads, bigger than the ones that destroyed Hiroshima, are still underneath the oceans around the world as a result of accidents. There are 25 nuclear reactors of the kind, not the same as Chernobyl, but nuclear reactors producing electricity on vessels on the seabeds of the world. About one quarter, we hear a lot about global warming and you know the protest at Heathrow and so on, but you hardly ever hear But about one quarter of the world's jet fuel is actually used by military aircraft. And about uh, military-related CO2 emissions come to about 10% of the global total. Uh, the military use inordinate amounts of, uh, of precious metals, copper, minerals, and so on. They excavate. They have enormous amounts of land at their disposal, even if there is no war. Uh, in this country, uh, more land than is in the county of Surrey is devoted to military use and military exploration. In America, more land than the, than the, the state of Virginia is devoted to the American, uh, to the, uh, to their military. It, the budget is unbelievable. We are now spending as a human family something like one and a quarter trillion dollars. That's a trillion is a thousand billion. So a, a billion is, is, is nine noughts. A trillion is twelve noughts. And we're spending a quarter on top of that. It is more money spent. Um, on war and the preparations for war than all the United Nations agencies put together. So when people talk about relieving poverty in Africa and don't mention war or the selling of weapons, which is so part of all this, uh, they are really uh, not giving the complete picture to be as polite as I can be. It's a, really a deception not to include that, that factor. Um, so th these are some of the features. And of course, in modern war, we have the permanent danger that we're going to stumble into a nuclear war by intention or by accident. At the moment, we have this nonsense position where the major nuclear powers say, you can't have nuclear weapons, but we can. That cannot last. It is clearly not a moral position. I believe nuclear weapons are fundamentally immoral. They, uh, they remove any distinction between competence and non-competence. And we now have about 25,000 in the world shared between nine different countries, if we include North Korea, and there will be others, and there will be non-state actors who acquire nuclear weapons in due course. And we have had a list of accidents. People don't talk about the accidents, but we've had so many accidents and miscalculations. I can only say God is very patient with his creation and very protective because really we should have had the ultimate disaster. When Robert McNamara came over here from the United States a little while ago, he was talking about the Cuba crisis, which you'll remember under Kennedy. The Soviets have, were thought to have missiles coming to Cuba, and the Americans were furious about this, and there was a great standoff uh, with Khrushchev, and uh, the Americans were as strong as could be. So actually, they made a private deal about missiles in Turkey as well, but they were as strong as could be. Um, and there were even American generals who were at the meetings who said, even after uh, Khrushchev had signaled that he was returning, even then they said, let's bomb Cuba just to punish them. Uh, that was the mentality. And McNamara said, we acted so strongly because we knew perfectly well that the Soviets had not yet put nuclear missiles on Cuba. And he said, afterwards we learned, not from the CIA, but from other sources, we learned actually 
the Soviets had put armed nuclear missiles on Cuba. So we were gambling with the wrong cards in our hands. And he said afterwards, he said, we were not saved by our good judgment. We were saved by good luck. And there have been many other accidents. And please, I remind you of what Hiroshima was. It was a small nuclear weapon, 12,000 tons of TNT. The the warheads on our Trident missiles in this country are at least 10 times as big as that. And the Hiroshima bomb ravaging the earth, it could destroy about a mile and a half square in the middle of Hiroshima, and it goes on killing today because of the radioactive effects which are passed on from generation to generation. So we are gambling with absolute disaster with the real ravagement of our earth. Now let me end on a, not end, I'm not going to finish yet, don't be so hopeful. Um, uh, I'm only getting into my stride. Um, uh, Let me uh, start now on a slightly more optimistic term. I do not think we are committed to ending conflict between ourselves by killing somebody else. I don't suppose anybody in this room, I hope not, has ever uh, actually murdered somebody else. I hope not. Um, I certainly haven't, um, although I've done some foolish things in the army that could have resulted in that, but I didn't, uh, thank God. Um, so we've all had conflicts, and we've all resolved conflicts. If you haven't had conflicts, you're a saint, and uh, there are very few saints around. So we all have conflicts of one sort or another, but we do not resolve our conflicts normally by killing other people. I come from a little street in North London. Uh, There are perhaps, uh, I don't know, 60 houses in two flats each one. It's 120 families or couples or something. And we have, I have Italians uh, from Guyana. We've got Poles. We've got Cypriots. We've got Kurds. I don't know who. Every, all kinds of people there. And, and, uh, we get on somehow. I don't say we all like each other. We don't all like each other. Um, the man who parks in my parking place is a matter of a great annoyance. But I have, I have never thought of putting a shotgun out of the window and shooting him, uh, ever. Although I get very angry. Um, because why? Because we actually have all kinds of mechanisms within which we actually can uh, resolve those conflicts. We have citizen advice bureaus, we have neighborhood watches, we have all kinds of things, we have local police force, a park police force, and so on. We have courts, we have uh, uh, county courts, we have small debt courts. We've developed a mechanism which more or less works most of the time. Not perfect, but it does most of the time. Furthermore, on my little street, despite all these different people, we don't have a number of things that the world at large does have. We don't have great social inequality. Um, it is not a rich area of London. Some may be more comfortable than others, but nobody is starving to death, and nobody is driving around in two Rolls Royces. Uh, we are more or less in the same position, so there is no sense that these people are really depriving me of my life and my livelihood, which is the way it is in many parts of the world. Secondly, everybody on our street who wants to uh, could stand for parliament or can write a letter to the paper or can become a local councillor or can do whatever they like in terms of expressing their political or religious views. Um, and and uh, that is a, a kind of freedom. We are lucky to have it in so far. It's not perfect and actually it's on the way back. But it's it's there at the moment and that is something to be treasured. Many people in the world have no sense of political rights. They are deeply deprived. I'm not going to, in this audience, go on about uh, the problems of the Middle East, but clearly one particular people has been deprived for very many years, and there will not be peace until there is some sort of justice. Peace is not tranquility. Peace is actually based on justice. One of our popes said 40 years ago, peace is the fruit of anxious daily care to see that everybody lives in the justice that God intends. So if we're trying to avoid war, we have actually to look at the problems of other people and do something about their sense of outrage and give them some kind of mechanism by which they can actually uh, achieve some sort of justice themselves or with our help. And in a sense, in uh, in Europe at least, he's looking at his watch, I know, uh, in, in Europe at least we've made a little progress. Um, uh, we have... Um, Today, uh, the two countries which inflicted uh, two, three major wars in less than a hundred years 
could not possibly go to war. Could not. Germany and France today are too interlocked in every possible way. War is absolutely an anachronism. And I believe that is true of Sweden and Norway. They were old enemies. They could not possibly go to war. We have now got, we haven't got a global police force, unfortunately. Um, Interpol is certainly not that. Um, and uh, we have very little control over major corporations who can ravage the earth in, the own, in their own way. We do have, which is a big step forward, we do have an international criminal court, um, and that is now capable of dealing with people who uh, conduct warfare in brutal and barbaric ways or in other ways deny human rights. Unfortunately, though the court was the result of work of, I think, of at least a quarter of the people in this room in numbers, very few people made the court possible. The big powers refused to allow um, a criminal charge to be brought against someone launching a war outside of the UN Charter. But we will get there. We have now got some control over the selling of weapons, um, thanks to a campaign called the Campaign Against the Arms Trade. Some major companies in this country are very discouraged about selling weapons abroad. And in fact, the major company that ran all the exp expositions in the east end of London uh, has actually pulled out of the business altogether. We are beginning to change the culture a little bit. But quite apart from the weaponry and the structures, it is the culture that we have really got to contend with because we have a mental cu a culture that makes war noble, glorious. It's entertaining. We see it on television. Uh, I've just seen in Manor House Station a lovely advertisement for a new, new film. There's a man with a knife waving a knife out. The killer series. Entertainment. Entertainment like that ends up in death on the streets in various parts of London. A war and killing is not entertainment, and we have to change that culture. I say with all respect, I'm a bit of a Republican, I have to tell you, but uh, I think it's a, it's a sign of the, of the culture of this country that the two princes have immediately to go where? Into the armed forces. That's their career. Why couldn't they go in the lifeboat service or the fire brigade or become nurses in intensive care units? The culture is still deeply a military one, and so we are about the business of changing the culture as well. But I am an optimist. I do not believe we were meant to blow this whole place up and finish. I believe that humanity has a common purpose. And as it says in the UN Charter, we are there to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And that, I think, should be an interfaith campaign of all of us. We don't want war. We want other ways of resolving our conflicts. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, uh, uh, If you bear with me a minute, um, <coughs> Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Um, I'd like to just um, compliment some of what uh, Bruce Kent has said. Uh, and also tackle some issues concerning the theme uh, ravaging the earth, the dirty business of war. I'd like to tackle some of those issues from a more Islamic law or Sharia point of view as well, because um, I've done I've done a talk uh, or presentations like this in a few places, not many places, a few places. And one of the uh, one of the constants that I found is that uh, many uh, uh, Muslims come up to me and say, well. Uh, what is, is there an Islamic position on these things? What does the Quran say? What do the traditions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, say? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and so on and so forth. And what I'd like to do in this uh, presentation, if I'm able, just to highlight some of those issues and also to highlight the actual issue of uh, the dirty uh, business of war. Um, I'd like to also start by mentioning that I was actually raised in, uh, on a housing estate in East London, and for about 35 years of my life, I was in one housing estate or the other. And uh, unlike uh, North London, uh, being raised in the 70s on, in an East London housing estate, when you ever got into conflict with someone, uh, we were given three ways of resolving conflicts. Uh, was either pulling out knives, was either just going fist to fist, and I was always very skinny and bony, and that was never an option as well or settling it through a game of table tennis. Alhamdulillah, I became a good table tennis player over the years. 
Um, similarly, in the very same housing estate that I grew up in East London, I remember one of the uh, oddities of life there is that uh, most of us would have to go and get our daily milk uh, from the local shop. Even though there were, uh, you know, the, there was a milk service there, the milk float would come round in the morning. But 90% of the uh, people in the housing estate, families, we would get our milk from the local milk shop. Not because of any loyalty, but because the kids, uh, and I had my moments at that, astaghfirullah, but the kids would go and pollute the milk or do something to the milk. And so over the years you learn, leave the milk alone, just get it fresh from, or fresh as can be from the um, shop. And there was a particular hill I had to, like walk over uh, every day to get the, uh, the milk in the morning. And one particular time, I walked past this wall, and, I w and it was a blank white wall. It was actually the wall of the pie and mash shop uh, that used to be there in, uh, in Caffle Road in East London. And I went to the shop, and I spent maybe 10, 15 minutes talking to the shopkeeper uh, about something, and I came back, and I found this, someone had uh, sprayed a logo and some message on this white wall. And it was really strange. First and foremost, I had never seen the CND uh, logo, a bit like a Mercedes logo. Uh, that's the only description I can think of. And then it had a message. It said, fight war, not wars. And I looked at that, and I was, I was in my teens. I thought, fight war, like, someone must have been drinking something solid there because that doesn't make sense to me at all. Fight war, not wars. It was only in later years, a few years later, where, whereby it was beginning to make uh, sense to me. Fight war, not wars. And that's something that's actually been deeply ingrained uh, uh, in me uh, for, uh, for quite a long time. So what I want to do is I want to just mention a few uh, points. A few preliminary issues first. Classically, in, his, in the Muslim teachings, in, in Islamic law, the issue of war and peace, when to launch war, when not, has traditionally been dealt with under the rubric of ahkam al-sultaniyya, the rules and regulations related to governance or the head of state. It's not really been something that uh, it's the uh, area of scholars, although they had written about it, or uh, citizens or subjects. And so generally you'll find discussions on war and peace and the rules uh, related to it, either in uh, books like that or in under the chapter of jihad in books of Islamic jurisprudence. Second point to bear in mind is that the idea of politics where and, and the idea of war and peace is related to politics. In Islam, politics is very much, or had classically, very much been related to the head of state. The imam, the, 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 the king, the, the, the president, whatever. And in fact, the Islamic term for politics, siyasa, we say Islamic politics or sharia politics, siyasa, sharia, is from that Arabic word, uh, sasa, to manage and tend to the affair of something. And someone who grooms a horse, looks after it, breeds it well, nurtures it, maybe a racehorse, is a sais. Okay, from where the word siyasa comes. Why? Because he's managed an affair and brought it to some type of fruition. That same idea of managing the affair and looking out for the welfare of, in this case, the welfare of the subjects or the citizens, uh, is where we get this Islamic term uh, siyasa from. And so that's very much related to not individuals in the classical teachings, but really the head of state. And therefore we have that rule, classically, uh, uh, jihad mawkulun ila al-imam wa ijtihadihi. That the affairs of war and peace are referred back to the head of state and his decision to go to war or not, classically. I, I just want us to have these background things in mind uh, because I want to mention one or two things built upon this. The question of, well, what did the Prophet Wasallam do, where and when, it's also a bit uh, up in the air. Why? Because... We know the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet peace be upon him, uh, he acted in uh, uh, many capacities. He had a, many, he had a multi-dimensional uh, capacity of acting. He was a father, uh, uh, he was a husband, he was a close friend, he was the head of state, he was, the, he was ultimately the Prophet, okay, but he was a spiritual teacher, he was a counselor, he was a reconciler, so on and so forth. And so sometimes when we read the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sometimes we're looking at a part of his life in which he is acting as the head of state. And therefore the quality of justice is more paramount when we're talking about authority and leadership. 
But then in other parts of his life, peace be upon him, we're looking at the concept of forgiveness and mercy is very paramount. Why? Because there it's the spiritual, ethical, moral uh, role of salvation and salvic teachings. And so we need to bear those distinctions in mind. And I've also put that in red. Must distinguish between what is prescribed or prescriptive in the religious teachings and what is descriptive. Okay, the prophet, as Osama, Dr. Osama told us yesterday, the prophet, peace be upon him, wore a long tunic, a thobe. That's not so much prescriptive, that it's just descriptive, because we learned Abu Jahl and other uh, others who weren't of the monotheistic tradition or is, uh, is Islamic tradition uh, also wore those type of things. Likewise, in war and peace, we have that kind of thing. So bear that in mind, and the modern world is very different than the pre-modern world. We live in a world now, for example, uh, uh, some years back, uh, when the then Prime Minister uh, went to Southeast Asia, to India and Pakistan, uh, and they were on the verge of uh, toying with the, each other and saber-rattling over, we've got a nuclear bomb and we've got a nuclear bomb, and you know, some of the country was all cheering with the flags and whatever, uh, it was felt that the then Prime Minister of this country would go there and negotiate uh, peace. Uh, he whispered certain words into the ears of the two governments of Pakistan and India and a few days later uh, people backed off or the countries backed off unbeknown to many uh, there were actually two deals also negotiated the Indian deal far greater than the Pakistani deal of selling weapons and military technology to India and Pakistan by the very British government and so on the one hand there is peace negotiations and on the other hand well the picture might say it all so, I mean, that's, a, and I don't want to give us the idea that every politician and every MP is like that and every, on a, but by and large, that is a, a, a world that we inhabit today, that type of world. And it reminds me of the, of the verse of the Quran, the meaning of which could be, uh, and it certainly doesn't apply to war alone, but it's general. And when he turns away from you, his effort in the land is to make mischief therein and to destroy crops and cattle. And God does not like the mischief makers. Okay, that's the end line for us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like uh, that type of corrupting uh, influence. Perhaps that picture says something as well. Spending contrasts. The world military spending, these are old figures and perhaps the uh, green leaflet that Bruce pointed out to has got <coughs> uh, newer figures, but it gives us an example. Uh, so let's just use these figures. <coughs> 840... A uh, billion dollars are spent worldwide on military spending, military technology investigations. And yet, the annual cost of global provisions of basic services to developing countries is only 80 billion. Meaning to, to inoculate against sport, smallpox and those various other typhoid and, and flu and to provide basic uh, sanitary uh, equipment and medicines to the developing country, to everyone in the developing country, would only cost 80 billion, yet we spend 840 billion uh, annually in, uh, in war, though it comes under the, the euphemism of, you know, the budget of peace or the peace budget. Annually, the United States, the largest military spenders, uh, research budget, uh, it's a military research budget, $75 billion, and yet the annual cost of providing health care nutrition for everyone in the world is only $15 billion. I mean, subhanAllah. If we're talking about human dignities and human rights and human welfare, $15 billion, okay, less than a quarter of the actual research budget in military, uh, uh, in the military field. The stealth bomber, $48 billion, $1.5 billion per plane, and yet to prevent malaria, half a million malaria deaths per year would only cost $1 million, one, or $1 billion. I mean, these are the disproportionate, uh, spendings that we have. And so when our governments and our leaders talk about you know, wanting to bring, uh, uh, wanting to have the world to be a better place, wanting human dignity to flourish. We need to bring these things into our mind that human dignities are being destroyed because of inequalities. Human dignities, the United Nations uh, uh, Health Service said there's enough food to feed the world. Yet to our shame, we live in a world where food rots and people starve. And we in the West, Muslim or otherwise, we are also responsible for that. India just celebrated her independence 
Uh, August, August is also uh, the anniversary, tragic anniversary of Hiroshima, 6th, the 6th of August, 9th of August is uh, Nagasaki. Uh, and Mahatma Gandhi has that, uh, has that famous uh, statement that we can benefit from, that the world caters for everyone's need, but not everyone's greed. And that's something we need to really uh, think about today. Issues and obstacles. Uh, Bruce mentioned that uh, the, 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 the nuclear treaty is uh, loaded. You have France, Britain, Russia, America, UK, who are allowed to have uh, nuclear technology. And over 150 odd countries have ratified the non-nuclear proliferation treaty. But what makes that a bit flimsy is that many of these countries are saying, why should we ratify this treaty when... Not only are they allowed to have nuclear weapons, but we actually get bullied by them as well in some form or fashion. And we no longer wish to be bullied. And so it creates an instability if one set of people have it, regardless of the justifications, and others don't. In the end, it makes it almost mute or redundant. And perhaps that's the way uh, some things have gone. Also the problem of, uh, especially from the Muslim point of view, even if you take let's just say Pakistan, and I, I don't want to pick on Pakistan, but it's the one that came to my mind, and it could be some other Ar uh, Muslim Arab countries as well. The huge costs of military spending, I mean, even if you took out the moral, uh, moral question of the issue of war itself, then the huge cost of military spending comes in the presence of many of these countries in the world are underdeveloped, have no infrastructure, no educational system, no health system, no very little. And yet, all of this money is spent on war. Why? The rationale is we need to protect our citizens. But our citizens are already dying. Malaria and smallpox and ill health or even just, they can't just get basic drinking water at their disposal, which is the case for uh, many uh, uh, thousands and thousands uh, in the world. The other issue from an Islamic point of view is the Islamic law is very pragmatic, especially when it comes to politics, historically. It has ideals. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, never wish to meet your enemy. It's not something that you're eager to do. But if you have to, then be firm. Okay, but never wish... And so that kind of characterizes the tendency of that's not something that conflicts really need not be settled that way. But push comes to shove and that's perhaps the only way. And maybe in the pre-modern world without the institutions of, uh, of conflict resolution that we have now or that we, the potential to have now, perhaps that may have been a, a course. That, that's another issue that could be argued or debated. But the point being is we have our, our Islamic law says that it's not the political ideals that really frame the issue. It's the hard facts on the ground. Meaning that many of our jurists today say, if we lived in a nuclear-free world or close to, as jurists we'd have no problem whatsoever of giving that ruling that nuclear weapons aren't needed. But just to be true to you, so I'm not treacherous to the trust of religious teachings, uh, a number of our uh, religious institutions, the Azhar, the, the oldest and perhaps the most reputable, uh, gave a, a, a fatwa in 2002 saying that nuclear weapons are imperative as a deterrent, not as a fast strike weapon. That's their opinion. Now, it's debatable because how do you ever use a nuclear weapon as a, as a deterrent and could you really use it as a, a non fast strike weapon and so on and so forth. Other jurists say, no, really, uh, it's, it's very up in the air and we should just work for Global nuclear disarmament, disarmament, which is what I suggest to you. Um, just, just, I'd like to just read one statement about nuclear weapons. This is from a book which um, Arunda T. Roy. She writes, If only nuclear war was just another kind of war. If only nuclear war was the kind of war in which, the countries, bat in which countries battled countries and men battled men. But it isn't. If there is a nuclear war, our foes won't be China or America or even each other. Our foe will be the earth herself. The very elements, the sky, the air, the land, wind and water will turn against us. The wrath will be terrible. 
Our cities and forests, our fields and villages will burn for days. Rivers will turn to poison. The air will become like fire. The wind will spread the flames when everything there is to burn has burned and fire dies. Smoke will rise and shut out the sun. The earth will be enveloped in darkness. There will be no day. Only interminable night. Temperatures will drop to far below freezing and nuclear winter will set in. Water will turn to toxic ice. Radioactive fallout will seep through the earth and contaminate groundwater. Most living things, animals, vegetables, fish and fowl will die. Only rats and cockroaches will breed and multiply and compete with foraging relict humans for what little food there remains or there is. What shall we do then? Those of us who are still alive, burned and blind and bald and ill, carrying the cancerous carcasses of our children in our arms, where shall we go? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we breathe? That, in summary, is the consequence of nuclear war. And we have just been told by Bruce that what hit Hiroshima was in comparison to what we had today really just a fly, a drop in the ocean of the, te the devastating technology that we have today. And so we should cooperate with those organizations. This is a suggestion. It's not a fatwa or anything like this. But we should cooperate with those organizations and individuals, wherever they be in the world, to work towards nuclear, global nuclear disarmament, even it, and be optimistic about it, even though there are many hurdles and barriers in the way. The Prophet, peace be upon him, reminded us cooperating in virtue and piety is an obligation of faith. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said about the Hilf uh, al-Fudul mm. that this agreement that happened by the non-Muslims, the idolaters, even before I was, I was a prophet, in which they came together above party spirit to get uh, to offer justice and to defend justice and the rights of the oppressed. If I was invited to that now in Islam, then by Allah, I would respond to such an invitation. Why? Because we're talking about human dignity and justice, regardless who, of who the initiators and actors are. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Jazakum Allah khairan. Thank you. Um, well, the, uh, the platform or the stage is now open for the next 20 minutes or so for Q&A. Um, I, just want to, I just want to verify, do we have a roaming mic for the audience? This one, the one I'm holding, okay. <laughs> I'm going to go to the lectern in that case and pass this round. Because I can't see the hands going up in the marquee and other places, I have to confine my attention in, the, in this room only. I already have one hand going up there first, inshallah. So I will take it on site. I better wear my glasses. And then we'll cover as many questions we can within the next 20 minutes or so. And if I do leave out any brother, I was going to say sister, then I apologize in advance. So first of all, the gentleman over there. Just wait for a second for the microphone to come to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kant. You have, you have spoken beautifully about the devastation of the war. And our brother here also given a very beautiful picture which our heart has rendered into pieces. Now I want to know whether these two criminals should be tried in the justice of the court. One is Mr. Tony Blair, the thief and the liar, and other one is the, what you call it, this U.S. Yes. And whether this, this two street criminal should be tried immediately. Otherwise the world will be devastated completely and no human being will remain as a human being. So this is my question to you. And thank, thank you. you very much for giving us this one. Well, the very answer to that, I'm afraid I tried to say in my talk was, we do not yet have a court which has the international jurisdiction in order to try such people. Unfortunately, 
We will one day, but at the moment the court does not have that power. It has not been agreed to that. You can help to make the court have that power by demanding reforms, but at the moment it doesn't. So someone like Blair and Bush will actually escape judicial sentence, but they are, I think they are sentenced already by the public opinion of this world. Blair has disappeared off the map. Nobody, a broker for peace in the Middle East? It's a joke. Uh, it's a, it's an entertainment. And I think that he will know, just as uh, Alistair Campbell and others from that camp know perfectly well, that they are in public disgrace. And actually that is a very serious thing for most of us. We like our good reputation. They have none. So, but one day we will have a law that will get them. Do you want to add anything? Uh, Walia? No. Um, I, I, I must point out the questions, although the first gentleman was quite precise, that the questions have to be short and to the point because of limited time, and the speakers are also going to be quite to the point as well. The next question is in front of me. A question to Mr. Kent. How would you define terrorism, especially given your Christian background and your personal moral standards? My definition of terrorism is direct assaults on non-competence by anybody. That, to me, is terrorism. I think Hiroshima was terrorism. I think what happened in 9-11 was terrorism. That is my definition. Direct assaults on non-competence. There is something to be said about Yeah. yeah. Um, Robin. In the, uh, in the Islamic definition, um, irhab, or terrorism, is very much associated precisely with that that those who are non-combatants are not allowed to be uh, intentionally targeted uh, in war. And that's war under the, uh, under the leadership of a head of state, not vigilante wars and, you know, cell wars. Uh, under the head of state, when, uh, when war is made, it's not permissible to intentionally target uh, non-combatants, be they women or children, who are normally the victims of, of any war, uh, the elderly, so on and so forth. Uh, in, in this conference, one uh, brother said to me uh, in a conversation about uh, Abu Alia, we were talking about something else, and he mentioned, but isn't there a, a statement, a hadith, which says uh, that, uh, that uh, there was a war at night during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and some uh, women behind the fortress, uh, they were killed, and the Prophet said, for who are minhum, or for whom minhum, they are from them. Uh, then the majority of jurists don't act upon that hadith, and those who do, normally the Hanbali school, uh, say that that's with a condition that non-combatants aren't targeted and that the harm in leaving the situation is far greater than uh, the harm that may ensue. And that's a, a debatable issue even amongst juries. So not even that can be used. Otherwise, the religious texts are categorical that non-combatants can't be uh, targeted or, or killed. And it doesn't matter who's doing the killing, whether it's a state or whether it's individuals, it would come under the general rubric of Irhab, as many of our contemporary jurists have said today. Wallahan. Thank you. Jazakallah. This is my direct question. I'm not going to go into any comment. Uh, do you think there would be peace in this world so long there will be the producers and manufacturers of weapons whose only business is to sell their productions. I think that peace becomes more difficult when the selling of weapons is a major industry, as it is in this country. It's more difficult. But I think that actually we can move on to make also criminal people who are selling weapons. We can change the political climate about that. But at the moment... Uh, uh, part, one of the one of the contributory factors to international violence is certainly the free flow of weapons from major countries like ourselves. So we have to be very good at campaigning against this as well. Assalamu alaikum. Wa With uh, respect to ravaging the earth, I remember um, vaguely that uh, bombs were being used in Afghanistan that were supposedly leveling mountains. Now, putting that to one side, we also know that bombs, especially nuclear material, is actually tested under sea. We have an issue today about global warming, which is being blamed on cars and all sorts of other things. Shouldn't some attention also be placed on the type of bombs that can actually be used to destroy mountains? You know, do they not have a role to play? And if so, shouldn't this be more publicly emphasized? 
I couldn't agree more. I think one of the problems of the global warming campaign is it has left the issue of militarism on one side. Just as the campaign to end poverty at uh, the G8 summit left the issue of militarism on one side. And of course, uh, instruments which destroy the face of the earth and move mountains and change rivers, these are part of the problem of climate change and our respect for the, the earth that God has given us. So yes, they should certainly be part of that factor. You can help to make it. You can help to make it. Raise your voices. You have your own organizations. Raise it and say, why aren't we talking about these things? Join these federations and demand that they include militarism as a major factor. Can I just uh, add to that as well? I mean, even though that be the case, you'll find that uh, the most crippling damage is done by uh, small incendiary devices, landmines, for example, okay? Um, so, I mean, that may be an issue, but um, we have small incendiary devices which cause, in the end, the, the, the human devastation is just as worse, if not uh, worse, point one. Point two is, the other thing is, uh, uh, the question I mentioned, Afghanistan. Uh, and inshallah, I don't believe that's the case, but I'd like to just mention it. Uh, this is not an issue about not hurting Muslims. This is not hurting humanity and the earth herself. Okay, Allah says, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa, that we are custodians or caretakers of the earth. Indeed, we have placed you as caretakers or custodians of the earth. And it's not a good way of being a caretaker. And when the custodians let go of the reins, all things run loose. And that's what we're having now. So bear, bear that in mind. It's for the whole of humanity. Because walakad karamna bani Adam, we have honored humanity. And it's not from the honor of humanity that people, especially women and children, they just get obliterated in war and it continues and continues. And sometimes it's for profit. Uh, when will war stop? Well, if I'm selling, if I'm selling uh, jackets and suits, okay, as a business, okay, and uh, people, so all of a sudden the, the fashion changes and t-shirts become the norm everywhere in life, I've got to do one of two things, either change my business or I've got to engineer uh, the, issue, the situation whereby it comes back in fashion, suits come back in fashion. War is like that. That uh, the business of war is such that uh, if, the, if, if my, me selling weapons, uh, people aren't buying my weapons, I have to either move out of the industry or engineer the situation whereby there will be more wars. And I'm afraid we perhaps live in, in, this, in the second case scenario in this day and age. Thank you. The gentleman at the back. Oh, sorry, you haven't finished. You haven't even asked yet. Sorry. Yeah. No, I didn't ask no, you. No. Is, is it working? <laughs> Please. Uh, Bruce Kent, welcome to, uh, welcome to this Assembly of Muslims. Uh, I belong to a group of 30 uh, brothers and sisters who have come from Denmark to come here. And we are very, very pleased to see that uh, this conference reaches out for the uh, society that they live in. Uh, welcome once again. My question goes... Uh, there's an obvious imbalance between uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons between Muslim and non-Muslim countries. Uh, wouldn't it be uh, a, a part of the solution, uh, I don't know, maybe you can help us with that, to uh, donate, uh, I don't know if there's any charitable organization that can do that, or establish that, a, a little a sort of a bomb uh, for a Muslim country, because we have... Uh, We've got, we've got, we've got a, a, a nuclear power in the midst of Muslim countries, and every time they try to develop some kind of nuclear thing, this little tiny country gets on and tells Big Brother to come up and uh, sort out the things. That's my question. I think you should be entertaining us at the Edinburgh Festival. Um, well, I don't think it matters what religion the bomb has. It is an immoral disaster. I don't think it helps for others. We have Pakistan, I presume, I don't know, it's a Muslim country. Officially, you have India, as a, if anything, it's a Hindu country, I suppose. You've got Israel, which is a Jewish country. Um, and you've got uh, the West, Christian countries and so on, so-called. Heavens above, I don't call this country Christian. But, but, uh, but um, I think the worst way is to have more. I think what we have to do is make the nuclear powers live up to their obligations. And their obligations is to negotiate abolition. And I'm not here for a long talk, but 2010 is the next review conference of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. There is a treaty already in draft. It covers everything, inspection, verification, criminal. It's there. It has never been looked at. Raise your voices and say to Gordon Brown, why don't you start negotiating the abolition of nuclear weapons for everybody? Start that, and it would be very positive. But anyway, thanks for your contribution, which I much enjoyed. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, question to Bruce and Usama. 
uh, Bruce suggesting that we could help actually bring in on the Court of Justice to bring Tony Blair and George Bush to justice and put him behind bar, hopefully. How can we do this? You want our help to do that. I, w I would be the first one to sign my name up. But how can we do this without us being branded as extremist or shackled away into some sales around London? <laughs> because the, the minute we, we stand up for justice without raising any arms, uh, because simply because we are Muslim, we get branded as extremist. But people like yourself, you can say what you like for as long as you like, and you are safe. So it's all right for you. <laughs> but can you please tell us how, what, what can we do to play it safe and bring justice? Thank you. I think it's terrible that I've become so old that I'm no longer an extremist. Um, <laughs> I have to tell you that in the 80s, when the conflict was strong and the hot Cold War was going on here, I was an enemy of the state. Absolutely. Telephone was tapped, journeys investigated, friends contacted, people losing jobs. I was, I even got a bomb once in the office, um, uh, which could have done a lot of damage. So uh, I, ha I hate not to be a, an extremist. I want to be an extremist. But actually, I would say quite honestly, I think some people you leave to God for judgment, and I think that Tony Blair and Bush will be judged in their own way. I think that if you have time to spend on campaigning, campaign against the arms trade, or campaign to get the 2010 uh, conference working, campaign for the rights of conscientious objection, or people not to have to go to war, campaign for things which you can actually see. Tony Blair and Bush are already world criminals, and nothing will add to that or take it away, even if they go to a court. I wouldn't waste your time. I, I, am, uh, I, am, I have no time for them at all. Uh, can I can I clarify? Um, did you really want to ask a question to Sidi Abu Alia or Dr. Usama Hassan? Both Usama Hassan as well. Um, Sidi Abu Alia, do you want to say anything at all? Um, but, uh, but Usama, come on, you might, you might as well come and say a few words. Okay, what about that question? Well, okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'd like to make a, um, a couple of points, a couple of important points. Firstly. Abu Ali mentioned the Prophet ﷺ saying, beautiful hadith, do not seek to meet the enemy. لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو وصلوا الله العافية And ask Allah for protection, for safety. It's very important, Muslims remember this, because, you know, it's well known, Quran and hadith are full of ayat hadith teaching about jihad, the sacred war. You know, similar to the idea of a just war. The argument here is actually, there's no longer any such thing as a just war. We have barbaric, modern Weapons and modern uh, bombs are weapons of mass destruction. It's actually impossible to have wars now without killing civilians. Okay, so the argument is that everything has changed, and that's why Muslims, I believe, actually must must join campaigns like CND and, and MAW, Movement for the Abolition of War, etc. That a very strong case to be made from Islamic law to say this is quite right, ab abolish war. It's also in the Quran. In the midst of Surah Al-Anfal, the ayat saying, get ready for war, it says, وَإِن جَنَحُوا لِسَّلْمِ فَجْنَحْ لَهَا وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ وَالسَّمِيُّ الْعَلِيمُ If people are uh, a threat, you have to prepare yourself. But if they're inclined towards peace, inclined towards peace and trust in God, for He hears and sees all things. It's really important for Muslims to realize this. This is in the middle of Surah Al-Anfal. The next surah is Surah Al-Tawbah. The most militaristic surah, but the title is repentance. It's about turning to God. And secondly, because we, we were talking about riba and usury, I mentioned a book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. I recommend it again, because another thing we have to realize is the role of, of banking and finance in financing the wars over the last few centuries. What we've seen is the bankers financing both sides of the war. This pattern has been repeated for the last few centuries in Europe, First World War, Second World War, you know, the Iraq Wars, everything. Dresden, they finance the destruction of cities and then finance the reconstruction of Iraq. You see, all the contracts going to Western companies to rebuild it. For a few, a few later, they destroy it again. There are all kinds of really sick things going on in our world right now. And, um, uh, yeah, and we ask Allah to give us understanding. Uh, just a, a small point there. Uh, not so much on the, uh, on the issue of war itself, but uh, something that Bruce just uh, mentioned. Um, I think one of the issues that we Muslims have to confront is that we see these injustices and we're sometimes the direct uh, uh, recipients of uh, injustices perceived and real. Uh, but we need to 
not be blasé about justice, but realize that uh, we don't have that concept in Islam that let justice be uh, done or let the heavens fall. Meaning that justice, because we have an afterlife as well. That doesn't mean that we're blasé or lackadaisical on justice and getting justice done. It just means that in God's divine plan, no matter how hard humans work, ultimately it may have to be left to uh, the divine agency uh, in the hereafter. And what tends to happen with Muslims is we get very psyched up and worked up and it's not happened, it's not happened. 20 years down the line, it's not happened, it's not happened. Perhaps, you know, going back to the Danish question, okay, I mean, if you see, forget about war, if you see Muslims talking about football, okay, or, you know, or just should the mosque have green walls or, or pink walls, okay, I mean, you'd think that this is, you know, calamitous issues. So sometimes, you know, we need to think about ourselves, which is why God says, "Inna Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin, hatta yuhayru ma bi anfusim." Never does God, never does God change the condition of a people until they change themselves. And so, the injustice is being perpetrated by certain governmental and ex-governmental figures is clearly one thing. But I need to ask myself this question: as a worshiper of God, what injustices am I perpetrating towards God, His earth, His peoples, and towards the very life God gave me? In the end, I need to ask that question and not be side, not be absolutely sidetracked by these issues, though they are no doubt important. With a slight confusion at the back, I mean, one of the brother should um, choose to give up. I'm, I'm confused which one asked first. The two of you standing at the back, you both raised your hands. I don't know who came first. Okay, that's the last question, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you've mentioned CND and you've mentioned, Bruce, your organization. Uh, in terms of working on an individual level, are there any groups that we can join that you would recommend that are particularly effective? I think you've both spoken passionately about the scourge of war and particularly the threat of, of nuclear war. Um, for, for me and for many others, I think these are relatively new issues and I'm not aware of what are the most effective lobbying organizations that we could perhaps lend our support to. Can you make any uh, recommendations? Thank you. Yes, I would urge you to get hold of a copy of the Hausman's Peace Diary and Directory, which is 5 Caledonian Road, because in the back there is about, uh, in the directory, must be 10 pages of organizations in this country, uh, the, of all areas of human rights, peace, justice, and so on, that you might want to get involved in. I think one of the most effective organizations has certainly been the campaign against the arms trade, which has just succeeded in getting the defense sales organization abolished. Now that is a major, major victory for 30 years of campaigning. So I think that's very important. I cannot not say that CND is desperately important. And I don't think that we have all that many Muslim members. We have a Christian CND. Why don't we have a Muslim CND um, as a partnership organization within CND? It would be wonderful if you, were here, if you were there. We'd really appreciate it. But there are many other groups like Amnesty, um, World Development Movement, all kinds of different organizations where people can go and use their talents. And since that's my last answer, I want to say how pleased I am to have been here today. If anybody wants to be to use me in some other place or time, please let me know. And I was really uh, moved when I heard our friend here talk about the idea of trusteeship because I thought in the Old Testament of my Bible it says that you are on this earth only as strangers and guests. Strangers and guests. And that's exactly what I was hearing from you. We have much more in common than we have that divides us. Thank you. Abu Ali, any, Abu Ali, any closing words? Inshallah. Um, in the end, uh, one of the descriptions that God has given uh, the Prophet Muhammad in the Quran, he is a prophet of justice as, uh, as were uh, his brother prophets uh, before him. Uh, but we know him more so as the prophet of mercy. We didn't send you except as a mercy to humanity, to the world. And the, we believe that the Prophet Muhammad's mercy through his teachings and, and being that wasn't just for his time and place, it transcended time and place. We need to have, when we're talking about emulating the Prophet, or, or for that matter, the Prophets by and large, alayhim salam, peace be upon them all, we need to understand that the foremost quality of the Prophet was not something exterior, the beard and a particular uh, physical uh, appearance, but he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he had a deep concern for humanity. And we need to begin to cultivate that concern genuinely. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us people of 
sincerity and people who have a genuine concern for humanity and that he give to us one and all afia and tawfiq assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and all that remains for me is to now thank uh, mr bruce kent for sacrificing his time and coming all the way uh, we are extremely glad that you did come and i'd like to, like to also extend our thanks and admiration to uh, sidi abu alia for that very useful input um, i'm not sure we don't have time obviously now to discuss whether Muslims should actually form a separate organization, the Muslim version of CND, and why we can't join hands in one organization with religious undertones, overtones. But uh, thank you very much indeed, and we hope we, hope we have the honor of uh, seeing you again in, in, in future events. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.